this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimal Living interview series. Today, I am thrilled to be chatting with Anders Ericsson, who is the world's expert on what makes experts, what makes great people great. I've been looking forward to his book forever. I got it the day it came out, read it basically the next day, uh, and then created the philosopher's note on it the day after that. And I think this is one of the most important books uh, we can read as we commit to optimizing and actualizing. It's truly an honor to uh, have the opportunity to chat with you today, Anders. I appreciate you taking the time and I appreciate the decades of work you've done to bring this wisdom to the, to the world. So thank you. Well, thank you uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure talking to you. Fantastic. Well, let's jump in. And uh, one of the things I loved about your book is the fact that uh, you started it with a chapter called The Gift. Can you talk to us about The Gift and how it might be a little different than how most of us conceive of that? I think that's one of the key ideas uh, that we're trying to you know, pursue in the book. A lot of people actually go out looking for their gifts, and I think I've noticed that talking to undergraduates, you know, that they're trying out this and that and hoping that somehow there will be this magical uh, sort of fit between their abilities and what uh, basically the, the kind of occupation or activity demands. Now, we take a, a very different view, and, and having spent about 30 years looking for the existence of gifts that spontaneously emerge. Uh, and just to take an extreme example, you know, uh, starting to be able to speak Chinese. Uh, I, I don't think any serious scientists believe that that's possible. And, and we argue that that's true when you look at other types of sort of high performance activities as well, that uh, every time when you find high performance, uh, you can find a, a history that sort of allows for a description how that performance developed gradually. Uh, and, and also you can find the kind of activities that seems to produce the necessary mechanisms that uh, have to be in place for somebody to exhibit that high performance. So this leads us to the idea here, you know, that you can actually create your gifts but that means that you <clears throat> have to commit or your parents have to commit helping you, sort of setting you in the right direction, providing you with teachers who can actually introduce you to the domain in a way that allows you to sustain, you know, not pushing you too hard, helping you develop the mental representations that somehow guides you throughout this process and eventually, you will get to a point here where you can take more and more responsibility for your own development and uh, develop training activities that are specifically useful to you. Which I'm excited to talk about in a moment because that's obviously the cornerstone of, of how one uh, masters any domain. Uh, and then just to, to underscore, the, the gift that we all have is the ability to improve ourselves, right? To optimize and actualize our, our potential in any area uh, in which we want to explore explore that potential and reach our peak, right? Exactly. So, so having that kind of help from a teacher that has actually helped other individuals you know, uh, uh, complete this journey to the high level of performance and that commitment because what we find is that, you know, it's not like you can just sort of relax and you automatically become uh, skilled. It's you have to change yourself. You have to basically engage in activities where you and your body will actually adapt to the kind of demands that you present to the body and, and your uh, cognitive system. Uh, and, and I think that's, it's kind of the heart of what we, when we talk about purposeful practice, you know, that effort of really trying to change something such that this will now be part of you uh, so you can actually build on that uh, as you keep improving other aspects. Yeah, I love that. And you make the point that, look, you may or may not want to go to the peak, the absolute peak in any given domain, but if you want to, here's how. <laughs> you know, you can be comfortable going to whatever height you want, but this is this is what the greatest among us are doing in order to achieve this level of, of expertise. So let's talk about practice. And you differentiate naive practice, 
purposeful practice, and then the gold standard, as you call it, deliberate practice. Can you give us an overview of each of those? Yeah. So, so this kind of standard practice is just doing what you're doing. So, if you have somebody playing uh, golf games on a almost every other day, uh, all you do is kind of doing the same thing. You're trying to do your best, but basically, you're not trying specifically to change any particular aspect of what you're doing. And I think it's the same thing for most professionals. You know, they are committed to doing a very good job, uh, but they just kind of keep responding to the events and the kind of demands that they experience during the day. So we basically argue that that's a different type of engagement in the activity. Uh, and, and when we look at evidence, uh, playing chess games or playing part of soccer or virtually any kind of activity does not seem to actually improve your performance. And, 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 and so what you really need is some activity that is pointed to some goal. Uh, and then it also has to be kind of a good activity that allows you now to gradually improve that particular aspect. So, so that's basically purposeful practice. We also talk about <clears throat> deliberate practice as sort of the gold standard where you're actually in a domain where a teacher and coach has actually you now assimilated all the knowledge that we know that's relevant here to effectively improve performance. And that teacher can now help you sequence the, perf the purposeful practice aspect. So you're actually building a skill following uh, kind of a sequence that has worked for other individuals. And, and that, that, I guess, is something that is not really available in some domains, <clears throat> especially new domains. There aren't professional teachers. There isn't a big literature on how people got very good at various things. And there, I guess, you, we, we have some hints here about how you can find effective practice uh, but in domains like music, uh, I would argue that it's well understood the kind of sequence that everyone seems to go through in order to reach the highest levels. That's great. So that's kind of the deliberate practice, music, chess, sports that have such a clear, you know, when you're performing at the peak and people have been there and done that, you get a coach who pushes you. And then purposeful practice, um, you touched on them briefly, but just to recap them for our audience, um, uh, my understanding is there's four specific elements. There's the goal orientation. There's being focused. This isn't a I'm having fun kind of thing. It's I'm focused and it's intensely so. And then there's feedback on your performance, right? And then there's the need to get out of your comfort zone in order to actually trigger adaption, adaptability, et cetera. Um, is that accurate? Yeah, and, and, and I would argue that in order to know that you're engaging in purposeful practice, the training tasks that you're doing, your current level is not where you wanna be. So there's a gap between what you aspire to be able to do and basically what you're doing and, and now by actually repeating and finding better ways of doing this task, you will eventually get to this uh, sort of new goal that your teacher or you set for yourself. And that kind of is almost feedback to you that you've engaged in practice, so something has changed. Mm -hmm. Your ability to do this new training task has changed. Now you have to make sure that that kind of benefit is integrated in the skill that you're doing. Uh, and I think it's a good question asking <clears throat> yourself, you know, and, and because it gets at that difference between natural practice and purposeful practice, what is it that have changed you? So after a day, basically, or a game of golf, what is it that you can do now that you could not do before? With purposeful practice, you can actually point to the thing you can do. And if it's well integrated in the task that you're doing, such that you've improved now your ability to read greens uh, for putting, that should basically be evident as you go out and play a new round of golf. That's great. Can you bring this home? Do you, do you engage in purposeful practice in your own work or have you over your career? Well, I, I you know, I'm 
sort of a, a scientist and 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 I guess at one point I was thinking about you know trying to acquire some skills but I think I found came to the conclusion that with my interest it was better for me to study other people acquiring skills so so <clears throat> trying to become a good researcher and basically develop now and understand ideas that other people have generated and, and see here whether we can actually find new knowledge. <clears throat> That's probably what I've been trying to improve. And I think it, it is interesting in, in the academic system, you write papers and then you give them to other people who comment on it and you keep doing basically that revision. And I remember that the first important paper that I wrote with <clears throat> uh, uh, Professor Bill Chase, I think we went 50 rounds with me writing and him commenting on things that I needed to improve before we actually submitted it. And I think those kinds of activities where you actually can gradually modify and improve a product is, is really uh, interesting. Uh, sort of situations where one <clears throat> you can see how some things get better and hopefully it will transfer now when you write your next paper so you have now learned some things that you can apply and you will actually do a better job that's great um and one of the things i was excited to ask you was when i look at my own work and what i'm doing and you know bringing a more conscious deliberate well for my domain there really isn't the the set of expertise to meet the precise definition as i understand it of deliberate practice but purposefully practicing and my emphasis has been more on building the systems to enable me to consistently create and uh and then a certain repetition right of just getting better and better and finding this tiny little just tiny little marginal gains in my own performance and energy levels and ability to kind of synthesize ideas but I was just curious if you had any insight in terms of how someone like me looking to master my craft would approach it using the wisdom that you've gained. Now, now one of the things, if you try to define now what you ultimately would want to do, and, and one way to do that might be to look at other interviewers that you admire <clears throat> and almost sort of ask yourself, if you were in a similar situation, you know, and you could maybe just look at the video the first couple of minutes and now see what are the transitions what are the basically <clears throat> ways in which this interviewer was able to elicit this or that uh, but i think you know doing something similar in, in in the sense of looking back on interviews i don't know if you have looked at interviews that you did a couple of years ago the interviews are kind of a, just a, a final little bonus to what I do. It's more of a fun way to connect with the author. And, and it hasn't been the focal point of this is a subject that I want to master. It's been more of a this is just, you know, a part of what I do, whereas I've been really focused on mastering the presentation and the teaching and distilling these ideas, um, if that makes sense. Well, yeah. I have to say that when it come, came to presenting the ideas in our book, I'm not sure that I can offer any suggestions for improvement because I think you did just a terrific job. Well, I appreciate that. And then then sounds like you'd support the idea of of uh, just because you mentioned this in the book, too. So we'll segue this back to kind of the more general conversation around the amount of, of time that you can actually invest in this type of practice. Right, because for me, it's continuing to, to just find those little marginal gains of getting a little bit better and then also more efficient in the actual creation of these. And, and again, like I said, it's very subtle distinctions at this stage um, in, in that domain. Um, so just getting to the point where the four hours, like you talked about the fact that you really can't put in more than four hours of, of deliberate practice. Can you talk about that? Well, what we found across domains is that when you look at elite performers, and actually have them keep diaries. What's interesting is that if somebody is completely focused now on, say, writing a novel, uh, it seems that four or five hours is about as much time as they can actually spend writing. And, and virtually all that I've found who have control over their time would actually start out writing 
and then at some point, basically maybe midday, they would stop, you know, maybe have some food. Uh, some of them would take a nap. Others would go for walks. Uh, but essentially, this time after writing seems to be sort of recuperation and just sort of getting down, uh, you know, to, to, to relax. So you can actually have a good night's sleep and then wake up by yourself in the morning and now being, you know, in the perfect state of continuing your work. Now, most scientists, you know, they don't really have the luxury here of isolating themselves because, you know, you have responsibility for teaching classes, interacting with students, and so on. So what I found is that when I talk to scientists, they spend maybe one or two hours in the morning, the first thing they do, and that will then sort of not kind of get them to the limits of how long they can kind of keep working, but they would then have enough energy and, and so they would be able to do a, a, a good job here interacting with people and, and because the level of concentration for giving a lecture would be much less than when you're actually trying to write something on a new topic that, that basically goes beyond what you can just sort of habitually do. Uh, and I think it's interesting. Uh, I've seen now several people experimenting with trying to put in an extra couple of hours in the afternoon for writing. And what they report is that when they actually start trying to integrate this work that they did later in the afternoon, they find they spend more time, you know, reworking it. So it's kind of not even uh, productive for them to try to, you know, get more time in. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting that, that it's a little bit of this marathon attitude that <clears throat> these people have pretty much a seven-day schedule where they actually are doing the same thing. So, <clears throat> and, and they sort of sustain it now sometimes, you know, for years. Uh, sometimes you have, end with a book, but typically a lot of authors would take a little bit of time off and then maybe start on a new book project. So it's almost like they have developed these habitual routines that have been crafted to support their ability to do the best possible job on this dedicated work time. That's amazing. And at the end of the day, that's arguably the most important part of the whole process, right? Is simply creating your life such that you can consistently show up and actually do this type of deep work. Yeah. And I think, you know, having a life where when you're actually relaxing, if you're starting to worry about 10 different things, uh, then that is a problem. And I think a lot of people have written about the difficulty. So you need to have kind of a stable life with people and resources that allow you now to kind of direct yourself and, and, and setting that up may be a difficulty for some individuals. But I, I think if you're really interested in that long-term kind of uh, production of, of useful work, then you invest in basically the foundation, which is, you know, providing this safe space uh, and then also giving you enough freedom to be able to dedicate that time uh, to your best work. I love it. And one of the things I talk about a lot in my work is the fundamentals of eating, moving, and sleeping, and, and training your mind, focusing. In, in your research, and I want to talk about the 10,000-hour quote rule, which you unpack very nicely in the book, and I think will be a, a fun chat. Um, you talk about one of the variables that differentiated those who were performing at the highest levels was actually the quantity of sleep, right? We, we found that, that the highest performers of the musicians that we studied actually slept more uh, than basically the, uh, the, the less accomplished group. And, and I think, you know, just looking at the diaries, it was very clear that the elite individuals, they would actually go to bed at a sort of, you know, around midnight or before midnight even, whereas the, the sort of the third group, the ones who did not get into the elite solo uh, uh, training, uh, you know, they would stay up to two or three sometimes and have a much more varied. And I think basically once you make that commitment to trying to have your best energy when you're practicing, then 
that basically overrides now maybe the <clears throat> the temptations here to kind of have fun and do this and that. And, and one thing that really struck me that I don't think we talked about in the book was how the best violinists were very careful when they arranged relationships and they found individuals who had an equal commitment maybe it was to music or dance or acting or science but that actually now allowed them to be able to to train without getting into this conversation here you know you don't love me enough you're going off practicing when in fact you know you should be spending time with me and and i think you know that is just another reflection here of <clears throat> designing a life that helps you be as productive as you can be such powerful and i don't think that was in the book that's such a good insight um let's talk about the uh the ten thousand hour and again i'm, I'm putting quotation marks up as i say this rule <clears throat> that malcolm gladwell popularized that you talked about in the book can you talk to us about uh how that is not in fact a rule yeah, well, especially the version that I hear from people who've read Malcolm Gladwell's book. It's, it's sort of the idea that if you just hang in there, if you're doing a profession and you've been doing it now for 10, 15 years, and then you count up the number of hours that you've been, <clears throat> you know, basically a truck driver or a medical doctor or a lawyer, that somehow that accumulation of time would make you into an expert. What <clears throat> we actually showed in our study was that it was deliberate practice, namely those hours when somebody was working on the kind of tasks that their teacher assigned to them. Working alone, which I guess is interesting because a lot of people, even our experts said that they had much more fun socializing with their friends than basically working by themselves. But so, so it's kind of clear here that they viewed this activity as necessary for them to develop themselves and the kind of abilities that were really important to them. So <clears throat> the first thing is that Gladwell talking about practice rather than deliberate practice, which is that structured, focused practice really makes a huge difference. And, and I think it's interesting that even the most talented, if you believe that there are people with a, a sort of special talent, seem to be spending that much time in deliberate practice before they reach sort of the highest levels. The other thing is, it doesn't seem to be anything magical about 10,000 hours. So if you use this criteria winning piano competitions uh, sort of uh, on the world level, you probably have spent more like 25,000 hours because those individuals who win are typically in their early to mid-30s. So <clears throat> that's basically the 10,000 hours that we talked about. Just measure the amount of sort of practice alone that these individuals had spent up to age 20. So between 20 and 35, uh, you have even more uh, time that they would have spent uh, practicing based on, on, on the data that we've collected. That's great. So the emphasis on deliberate practice, not just the, the normal standard naive practice of just simply doing something again and again. And then also the fact these were 20 year olds who were simply deemed to be potential soloists uh, not necessarily, well, they hadn't made that level yet, right? So there was still... A exactly. Yeah. Um, I really appreciated that insight. And then uh, I want to talk about adaptability. The way that you talk about homeostasis and the fourth principle of, of purposeful practice was you have to leave your comfort zone. No growth occurs while you're hanging out doing something that you're already you know, comfortable doing. Can you talk to us about um, the importance of leaving our comfort zone and then homeostasis, adaptability, etc.? Well, I think the easiest for me uh, to describe that is for runners. And, and I know a lot of runners who enjoy going out jogging, uh, but typically most of them that I talk to 
you know, they basically jog to a kind of a comfortable level. And they, and one test you can probably make is, can you talk when you're running? Uh, if you can talk, you're probably not pushing yourself to the point here where you're actually stress putting stress on your body. Uh, and we've found, or other people have kind of looked at what happens when you actually engage in very intensive training. Well, it turns out that you will generate biochemicals that in turn will actually activate genes that are part of your DNA, but isn't typically uh, sort of activated unless you stress various body tissues like your muscles sufficiently uh, to actually lead to that reaction. And, and one of the easiest observable signs here is that after about two or three weeks of intensive training, uh, there will be capillaries growing around those muscles that you've actually pushed to the limit. And by actually further pushing, you can actually increase the diameter of arteries. You can actually see a remodeling of the heart. And one of the kind of really surprising things is that if you stop your training, your heart will actually revert back to the sort of the normal size of hearts. Uh, but while you're training, and actually, in some ways, if you didn't train, it would be a pathological heart that would be a sign here of some kind of disease. But it really shows here how adaptable the body is if you provide it now with a kind of strain that then leads it to respond and adapt and then actually giving you more power to do what whatever task you're engaged in doing. That's fantastic. So the adaptability that only comes once you've stretched yourself and then the body says, okay, well, you want me to be able to do this. I'm going to have to get stronger, right? I'm going to have to get better. Right. And, and I think it applies even to the mental part. So if you're actually trying to go beyond the best that you can do, so you're actually stretching yourself, that will actually now kind of elicit a reaction that somehow will permit you uh, to, to kind of start a long-term change. And I think the, the, the good thing about the 10,000 hour rule, I think is pointing out that there's this very long gradual sort of developmental process. And I think a lot of people expect you know, that they would be able to do something very rapidly. And if they can't do it, they infer that they don't have the innate talent that's required when in fact they may well, you know, at least that's what our evidence shows, with the right kind of practice, they will actually be able to gradually attain that uh, kind of adaptation over time. Key, key phrase there, over time. Uh, the willingness to uh, to go on the long haul to reach that peak. Um, you've, you've touched on it a couple times, but I'd like to hear you talk about mental representations and, and the role that they play in this process. Well, if you're acquiring a new skill, what we find is that basically your thinking that helps you now kind of make changes to your existing skill. I, I think maybe the easiest thing is to think of a soccer player or somebody on a, on a basketball player, they basically, there's a lot of things happening around them. What we find is that the expert players, they've actually developed now a way of mentally representing. So they can scan the environment and actually mentally represent now all the different players, even the ones that they can't see, uh, what they where they are and where they're likely to be within the next second. And that kind of way of mentally having a, a, a description of what's going on and being able to pick out you know, all the relevant pieces of information will make you, you know, much more able here if you get the ball to actually do something that is going to be successful for you or for your uh, basically teammates. And it's only gained again through that deliberate practice. And one of the other stories that was great was the chess players and their memory for mid-games of actual potential games was far superior to the normal person. But if you mix those pieces up and they weren't actually anything that could ever happen in a real game, those supposed memory gains were gone. And it was all about the mental representations that was underlying the, uh, 
the experience, right? It, exactly that 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 meaningful structure of the chessboard basically is something that the expert can see and really make meaningful sense of. But if you rearrange it so that pattern is no longer there, uh, their performance is virtually indistinguishable from less mm. lesser less skilled. Uh, players. Yeah, mental representations. That's one of the things I mentioned in the video I did was that, and the note was that that's what I feel like I'm doing is just just immersing myself in this wisdom and being able to see these different little models that come up. And I've likened it almost like a spider web, or there's just different lines that are coming in and more securely harnessing all of those truths and making it easier to kind of uh, to uh, to integrate and synthesize and all that good stuff. Um, and, and, and I think one way that you can kind of test yourself on your mental representation is actually to try to remember what happened in some kind of activity. So if you're playing chess, basically being able to remember what kind of moves were made, because that seems to be very, very correlated with your mental representation. And, and sort of a beginner <clears throat> will only remember sort of the most immediate things, but the chess player who's actually seeing these patterns and, and these developments that go across moves will be able to recall, you know, all the moves in the chess game and also remember uh, what they were thinking hmm. at the time. It's great. Kind of the recall, the active recall is a process of strengthening those connections. Um, you mentioned that the Homo sapiens, you know, it's one way to look at our species, but you, you recommended it something, something different. Can you tell us about that? <clears throat> well, you know, we basically wanted to focus in on this adaptability. So Homo exercise would be sort of a, a way of stressing the human's ability here to change themselves. And I, and I think in the future, with the development of new technology, I don't think we can really imagine how a human can really use that technology to amplify and then basically build new skills that really you couldn't even imagine, uh, you know, maybe 50 years ago. So <clears throat> now sometimes humans are using computer programs so they can actually use the chess programs, but they can actually now be on top of them. And, and that seems to be a much stronger kind of combination than any individual uh, chess program. So once you're actually seeing that possibility of, of using computers as tools for you to accomplish things, I think we can almost start seeing possible ways in which humans can achieve things that without the tools of the computers wouldn't have been possible. Fascinating. Well, we've uh, we've simultaneously covered a lot in this short period of time, and obviously still just barely scratched the surface of the book. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you think is important to highlight? Well, I, I think we talked a little bit about in the book about how adults are actually able to acquire pretty amazing skills. So some people think that you can only do that when you're young. Uh, I think we're we're able to review a lot of evidence showing that adults can actually acquire pretty amazing skills even if they start in adulthood. And, and I think that's kind of an important thing, especially as we're talking about a society where more people will sort of be in the retired phase, which may be a really outstanding opportunity to acquire or improve some of your skills that you already have acquired and, and basically get the fruits and the benefits of uh, the experience of actually reaching a, a kind of a high level of performance, hmm. doing something where you can actually share products uh, with, with, the re uh, with all your family and, and the rest of the world. That's fantastic and so important. That brings us all the way back to the first idea, which was the gift. We all have the gift. And we have that gift throughout our entire lifespan, right? <laughs> that, that's, that's true. And, and, and the saddest part is if people think that it's not really available to them. And I think by seeing examples of other people similar to them who have actually been able to, you know, acquire skills and start doing really in some ways – enjoyable and, and, and things that 
people surrounding them can enjoy, you know, that provides, I think, promise for a much richer life uh, mm. than if you basically believe that you're just going to be a consumer. Hmm. It's powerful. Um, I appreciate your wisdom, Anders, and I like to, to wrap up these chats with one final question, which is if you could share one piece of wisdom with someone passionate about optimizing their lives, what would that one piece of wisdom be? And it might be something we've, we've touched on or talked about in depth or something new. What would that be? Now, one, one piece of <clears throat> advice that Bill Chase gave me, which I thought was interesting, and I think it has to do for anybody who is trying to establish themselves in a field. And he argued, try to be an expert at something. It may be very, very restricted, but when people are going to talk about you and what it is that you can actually contribute, it's important to have a sentence that people can say. And I think when I started in science, I guess one of the sentences that, that people had about me was my work on improving memory performance. And so, so basically that was a relatively limited area. And I, I guess I was really make, trying to make sure here that I knew as much as anyone could about memory experts and, and basically how one would be able to train normal people to actually reach expert levels when it came to memory. Hmm. So finding that one domain, being specific, um, and then being willing to make the trade, you didn't say this, but to extend it a little bit, to be willing to make the trade off and say, well, I can't be great at everything. I'm going to need to put my energy into this one specific thing that I can truly distinguish myself in. And that's obviously not without risk, right? I think that's a hard choice. And, and, And I think what Bill also said was, once you've established yourself, you can now actually start adding things to it. But but I think the key here, and, and in many cases, there's competition for resources where it's actually helpful to be able to sort of really attain that label, whatever activity that you now determine is going to be your sort of area where you're going to be the world's expert on. That's great. Uh, my sentence that came to mind was more wisdom and less time to be able to distill this wisdom in a meaningful, practical way for busy people. Um, and again, just so inspired by your work. I appreciate the decades that you've put into it. And I, as you can tell, I don't even know if I mentioned the name of the book in the, in the intro. It's Peak, subtitle Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. Again, Peak, um, find it wherever you get books. Highly recommend it. Um, really appreciate you and, and your life's work and uh, how much that's benefited me and I know countless people around the world. So thank you, Anders. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, allowing me to talk to you. It was wonderful. Hi, this is Brian. A lot of people don't know all the stuff I do beyond these free videos I share on YouTube, so I thought I'd do a quick video to give you an overview of our membership program that you can get access to and get a ton of other stuff. Uh, So here's a quick look. 10 bucks a month, join the Optimal Living Membership Program. You get instant access to 250 philosopher's notes on some of the best Optimal Living books out there. Old school classics, positive psychology, modern stuff, mindfulness, peak performance, purpose, neuroscience, wealth, etc. Um, And what you may not know is that in addition to the PNTV episodes, I create PDFs on all these great books. So six-page PDFs. Let's take a look at one of them. Joseph Campbell. You want to figure out how to live your hero's journey. Well, this is a great place to start. I basically pull out my favorite big ideas, riff on them, connect them to other books and other ideas, and help you apply this wisdom to your life today. That's what the PDF looks like. Again, we have 250 of these on all these different great books. And then I record those PDFs as an MP3. So you can listen to that MP3 while you're on a walk or working out or doing some errands or whatever. Um, That is Philosopher's Notes. Uh, A lot going on there. And then in addition to Philosopher's Notes, you get access to Optimal Living classes, Optimal Living 101. Idea here is that all those great teachers come back to the same big ideas again and again and again. I distill those ideas into classes. Super practical, fun, inspiring classes ranging from Habits 101, Confidence 101, Getting Stuff Done 101, Meditation 101. 
instant access to all those classes. And then future classes include Relationships 101, Energy 101, Purpose 101, Business, Goals, etc. Those are our full length classes. And then I create micro classes, two to three to five minute little bursts of wisdom on my favorite great ideas from these great books across the domains that you want to optimize in your life. So we have dozens of these so far. I create 50 new micro classes every month and 10 new philosopher's notes every month for 10 bucks a month. So we're blessed to have thousands of members who are uh, enjoying the program and sharing some incredibly kind words with us. And uh, super simple, 10 bucks a month, cancel any time. Would be honored to be a bigger part of your life. And I appreciate your support. And uh, here's to optimizing and actualizing.